I don't know about you, but I am absolutely fed up of layers. Layers, they're just so irritating, you can't get rid of them, they're in your face all the time, attention-seeking things that you just wish you could never see again. Ugh. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. I am, of course, talking about PVB. You might have heard of it. It's very much not new. It's been around since something like 2016, but it's slowly gaining popularity. Well, no, it's it's not gaining popularity, but more manufacturers are starting to make it. So I guess it's up to you, the viewer, and me, the whatever I am, to make it more popular. I've done my bit over here by buying six reels of it. We'll, we'll get to that. So the basic premise is that PVB, or polyvinyl butyrol, not to be confused with PVA, which is something entirely different, PVB is not used as a support material, but it's a 3D printing thermoplastic in its own right. It is the material. What makes it special is the ability to vapor smooth it with moderately non-dangerous chemicals. We'll get to that. It's a semi-transparent, slightly waxy looking plastic that I couldn't get any of in completely natural colour because it's out of stock, but this is probably the closest. You can see that it's not a whole lot different to a natural looking PETG. But as a thermoplastic, it more closely represents PLA. To print it, you need almost, but not quite, the same settings as PLA. We'll get to that. The other presentation you can buy PVB in, presumably mixed with an opaque dye of some sort, is more like this stuff. This also kind of looks like PLA. I've got in total two reels of Prusament PVB in these kind of natural colours, and I've got three reels of other branded PVB in more solid normal colours. So PVB is supposed to dissolve in alcohol, and that's why we're interested in it. Not because we particularly want to dissolve it, that would be inconvenient, and we definitely shouldn't be drinking it, don't do that. Ultimately, we want to smooth it. This is uh, three test tubes. I put three pieces I printed into the three test tubes and I'm about to awkwardly add isopropyl into the left one, which is 99% alcohol by volume. Poisonous alcohol. Uh, whiskey into the second one, which I guess is technically poisonous as well, but people drink it. I can't really comment on that. This is 40% alcohol by volume and water to the third, which is also poisonous if you have enough of it, but it's water, 0% alcohol, obviously. Leaving these for 24 hours pretty much tells us everything we want to know. The isopropyl alcohol has completely obliterated the PVB, turning it into goop. The ethanol, and I think that's being a bit too kind to Jack Daniels, has affected the PVB, but not really as dissolved, and that is not because ethanol doesn't work as well, it's because ethanol at 99% by volume is nearly impossible to buy as a normal person, because we'd all be drinking it and not paying tax on it. And... That would be kind of like a drunken anarchy, and that can't be allowed. Also, at 99%, ethanol is actually surprisingly dangerous, so we have to be saved from ourselves, I guess. Anyway, if you did have ethanol at 99%, then I believe it would just behave the same as the isopropyl at 99%. The water in the last sample is acting as a control as we expect, and it does absolutely nothing. Well, visibly anyway. So back to print settings. You want about 215 Celsius for a hot end temperature to print this stuff. It does vary quite a bit. The Prusament seems happier at 225, as the layer adhesion is a bit poor at 215, whereas the red stuff I've got seems to prefer closer to 205, but that's kind of the range, somewhere between 200 and 225 Celsius. In terms of bed temperature, it is imperative, and this is not optional. You have to have the bed at about 80 degrees C for the first layer, and you can drop it a bit after that, but not really below about 70. If you don't do this and you don't run the bed at 80 C for the first layer, then you are going to be making spaghetti. It will not stick to the bed. It will just lift. Uh, side note, this is also a problem for enclosed machines because at these temperatures, PVB, um, yeah, it's a fast way to get heat creep in your nozzle. And I did get a blocked nozzle and I got a blocked 0.2 bamboo nozzle. And that is an absolute nightmare to clear. I won't go into how, but yeah, you don't want that. So you absolutely do need to open the door and lid on an enclosed machine. If you're printing PVB, that is also not optional. The printed finish on PVB is actually quite smooth already, so you'd be forgiven for wondering why you need to smooth it anyway. And honestly, 
I'm not that sure either, but we'll, we'll do it anyway. And it does have a pretty striking effect, as you'll know from the thumbnail. The smooth PVB does look significantly different, at least when it's done properly. There's quite a few ways to smooth PVB, and I will go into exactly four of them in this video. These are the only ones that really matter, and every other method seems to sort of be a variation on them. These four methods are Vapor, Dunk, Spray and Paint. At least three of those are self-explanatory, but we will start with Vapor. This might be something you've encountered with ABS, where you use Acetone Vapor to smooth the surface of ABS. Well, it's kind of the same, but it's way less dangerous and in some ways it's easier. Uh, what you do is you create a source of alcohol vapor, probably spilling it everywhere in the process. Luckily, isopropyl is also a cleaning fluid, so that's usually not the end of the world if you spill it, but obviously you don't want to spill too much. And then you seal the container. In this case, I have a cloche from Ikea, which actually works pretty well as it does seal quite effectively. You then want to leave that there until you have the desired effect, and that's why it's important to have a transparent container so that you don't have to keep opening it to check, which would let the fumes out. This will be in the order of several hours, perhaps 12 to 24, depending on what the desired effect is. One thing I did or seem to note is that the vapors either hang out low in the container or they condense on the cold base of the chamber somehow. This causes whatever's touching the base of the container to soften and it will collapse or at least melt at the bottom. So you probably don't want that, you might do, but most likely not. So to prevent that you need to raise it up a bit. I did create these stands and I printed them out of PLA. They print terribly but who cares, they do the job and that's all that matters in this kind of situation. I think if I had a comment about the vapor smoothing method, it would be slow, but it is very even and consistent and it doesn't use much isopropyl because you're enclosing it. So it's kind of in there for the duration, just being recirculated because the whole part, or at least a good amount of the part is getting fully penetrated by the alcohol. You will find it comes out of the chamber very soft. And while it should eventually return to something like the original hardness, this process will actually take days during which time the part is prone to being deformed if you happen to squash it. So you have to be quite careful of that. If you've done vapor smoothing with ABS, then you may have heated the chamber while you did it. That's quite a common method because it speeds it up. You can do this here too, and I'm going to say that's at your own risk. The combustion temperature of isopropyl is quoted as being in the hundreds of degrees C. Check that for yourself, don't trust me. But bear in mind that that's dependent on pressure and so a sealed container being heated up is going to have higher pressure naturally and you don't want any explosions. So I'm not going to recommend that simply because you can use patience instead or another method. But if you must try this, then I'm told the best way to do it is to have the part colder than the alcohol vapor somehow. This encourages condensation onto the part and this will make the process significantly quicker and the results will look more like if you were spraying. Method number two is brushing, and that's as simple as it seems. You get a paintbrush and you brush the isopropyl on. 
It can leave smudges, but it probably won't as long as you make sure you load the brush. It's sort of like the opposite of normal painting. You want to make sure that you are getting a lot of isopropyl on there so that it's not soaking and drying and then starting to smear. As you add more coats, the part will soften and get more sticky. And I think that's the desired effect, because if you let it dry between coats, then you won't have as much effect on getting rid of the layer lines, if that makes sense. When you use this method, it gets really sticky really quickly and it starts to resemble a half-eaten boiled candy that you just found wedged down the side of the car seat. So make sure you plan for that. You also don't want to leave fingerprints, so I would recommend gloves. And I would say gloves are essential anyway because you don't want this sticky stuff on your hands, trust me. And that's probably as good a time as any to point out that how important it is to read the safety data sheet for anything like this that you're doing. You need to be reading the safety data sheet for the material and for the isopropyl. You might think that you know everything, but trust me, there's going to be something on these data sheets that you don't know. Isopropyl is nowhere near as terrible as acetone when it's vaporized or sprayed, but it's not by any means nice. Um, it won't really harm your skin other than drying it, but if you rub your eyes or pick your nose, really don't want to do that. Or if you get it splashed in your eyes, then you're going to be in a world of pain. Ultimately, just be careful. Especially with method three, which is spraying. I would recommend goggles for this because not only you're making an aerosol, but you're also being told to ventilate the room, which means this stuff could go flying into your eyes just by picking up a draft. You can get isopropyl in a spray bottle like I have because it's meant for first aid, where I guess they don't use goggles. So I do wonder how many times that might have led to further first aid by accidentally getting it in someone's eyes. But anyway, you're creating a mist of isopropyl, so you want to be out of the way of it. You really don't want to be breathing that. I recommend holding the parts at arm's length and also putting them inside some kind of box so that as soon as you've sprayed, you can put the lid on. And not only does that stop it from vaporizing out of the box into the room it also means that you get more value for money because you've just sprayed a mist of isopropyl and that will that will stay in the box so you're kind of getting a bit of free vapor smoothing in, in the deal the spray method is probably overall the best method in terms of a uniform finish if you don't want to wait for vapor smoothing and you do have to apply this multiple times. You really do have to apply this multiple times because it's not very effective if you're using a fine mist. And obviously if you're using a non-fine mist, then it's going to drip down and probably make a terrible mess. So you're kind of looking at upwards of five times to, to have to spray to, to get any kind of decent effect here, I think. The last method is dipping, which is actually not as bad as it sounds when you when you actually do it. It carries extra hassle because when you dip PVB into isopropyl, you are actually contaminating it, which means you can't just put it back in the bottle. You might not be able to see that, but it's happening. This kind of means that you have to be able to store the isopropyl that you're using in between uses, and it's just annoying. I bought these lids from Ikea. I can't recommend them. There's a really good chance of you spilling the isopropyl and I didn't do that but that was probably good luck not not good planning so overall I think this method is best done in a small container for small pieces like like miniatures like I've done here and I should mention there are responsible ways to dispose of isopropyl you absolutely must not pour it down the drain and this goes for resin as well where we where we use a lot of isopropyl do not pour it down the drain you have to evaporate it which is not a quick process because it doesn't evaporate that fast. So yeah, unless you're doing a lot of dipping, then this method will be wasteful. You're going to have a lot of waste liquid to, to deal with. But the dipping method does work and it works really well. It's the one method that you're most likely not to have to repeat, or at least a maximum of twice, I think. But you do need to allow the part to drain off afterwards. The drips are messy and sticky and tedious. And of course, again, the part gets really sticky and really prone to fingerprints, possibly even more, and that means more dust, and so you have to cover it to avoid dust sticking to it between applications or while it's drying. While we're talking about messy and tedious, have you ever tried making your own PCB? Back in the day, the only choices we had as makers we didn't even call ourselves makers back then. I'm not really sure what we would have called ourselves. But the only method was to make our own PCBs, which almost nobody was doing because it's messy and tedious. Or 
you would use breadboard, which wasn't cheap like it is now, actually. But for permanent wiring for a circuit board, you would have to either try to use this board with holes in it, and you'd have to wire each component separately, or you'd have to redraw the entire circuit with this stuff called strip board. And you have a lot of limitations there. Rumour has it, though, some people are still using this stuff. I'm not sure why, because you can literally get entire PCBs made and sent to you from PCBWay. Do you remember this tool? Are you still using this? Do you even know what it's for? Let me know in the comments. If you want your electronic projects to look professional, then why not take the time to make them into PCB designs and get them manufactured by PCBWay? You can even put cool logos and funny things on the silk screen if you so wish. PCBWay also offer 3D printing services like resin, but also SLS and FDM, and also metal. Go check them out by following the links below and have a look at how easy it is to order PCBs for your projects. All the links are below. Thank you, as always, PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Now back to it. One of the things I noticed a lot with PVB, especially the cheaper brands, is how much it strings. So for that reason alone, I, I recommend printing Prusament PVB over all the others. I think also a large reason why it strings this much is because it is really very, very hygroscopic. I think it's probably one of the most hygroscopic materials out there. Most of my reels, in fact, all of the ones that weren't Prusa ones, were popping and steaming when I, when I got them and I had to dry them. Also, a funny story about that. You see, you need to dry your filament at about 45 degrees and not for too long either. It's very, very sensitive to drying. If you do what's advised here and dry at 60 degrees C, at least for most PVB, at least especially for this red reel, you get a ruined reel. So I wouldn't recommend going above 45 degrees. I did get another reel of this stuff, which was annoying because I didn't need that much of it. I dried it at 45 degrees for about four hours and it was fine. So I guess that's a lesson learned for 17 pounds. So this is the part where we talk about applications. Ultimately, PVB is suitable for almost anything where PLA is suitable for, give or take. Probably not in contact with isopropyl, though. It has a reputation for being brittle, but I think that's probably maybe slightly unwarranted. If you smooth PVB, it could potentially make it stronger. I didn't test for that. But ultimately, the main application of PVB is going to be aesthetic, i.e. decorative. You might not like the smooth look, and I'm not sure I do, but there are degrees of the smooth look, and I did really like the jelly glassy look of the, the more transparent versions, like the Prusament PVB. So ornaments like the balloon dog here are great applications, as could jewellery be. Buttons um, on an arcade stick and controls, things like that could be really nice if they're smooth. And also there's vases and so on. If you can think of any application that I haven't mentioned or you've used it for any application that I haven't mentioned, then let me know in the comments. I'll finish up at this point and you can decide whether you want to try PVB. I would say it's worth a go because the material can be had for fairly cheap and a spray container of ISO is also pretty cheap. You probably already have one because it's used to clean your printer bed and on the bamboo machines it's used to clean the rails. I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.